In this video, I'm going to break down the process of rebuilding our 1998 Haas VF2 two-speed gearbox. This is going to be a one or two video kind of vlog style. And with this, I've already taken it apart. We were kind of frantic to get to figure out what was going on with this thing. It was making a terrible noise. We figured it could be the gear set or the bearings. So we realized it was the bearings. I believe this was replaced at one point. Not a big deal. When they go bad, people usually just buy a used one and throw it in there. This has kind of a different serial number. I'm not too certain if that's important or not, but we assume it's been replaced before. Uh, this thing was very grimy, very dirty. Obviously, we went ahead and just kind of took it down, give it a, a pretty good cleaning. Uh, we're gonna clean it up some more. We'll start out with, this is obviously our base with our isolators. And inside here, the casting. Not too dirty, a little bit of grime, something I guess you would expect. Just like, you know, like a car with a bunch of miles on it, you open up the transmission, it's just got a little bit of dirt in there. When we disassembled it, I want to start out with this. This is probably the, one of the key things that why, why Haas doesn't recommend doing it uh, yourself or Haas won't even do it themselves. They will sell you a new assembly, but I haven't found one on the Haas website that has a 20 horsepower motor. The, the, the closest one they have with a, the correct taper is a 10 horsepower motor, which isn't going to work. And they're 10 grand. One of the things after disassembling it, you take this off. Obviously, the motor sits on top of here on these three bolts. One, two, three. It has the retaining clips for the bearings, for the upper side of the bearings. This is up, this is up here. And on the bottom side, this main shaft protrudes through here, and this cog gear is tolerance fit to it. There's no keyway, it's not tapered, it's a straight bore tolerance fit. You can press it off. You can give it a little bit of heat to ease it, to make it easier to press off, but it's not gonna damage it if you press it off in, in a correct way. Meaning it's it just straight up and down, even amount of pressure, etc. Supporting this, make sure it doesn't bang through. Because uh, even with the extension maxed out due to our spacer, we had about a quarter inch left to get this pressed off of this shaft. And it was still a, quite a bit of force to get it to press off. Going back to assembling, what you have to do is you have to heat up this bearing. Now we have a toaster oven, so we're gonna go ahead and heat it up. And we're actually gonna stick this, after it's assembled, stick the snout of this on the main shaft into a container of dry ice, which should, in about an hour or so, maybe two, we'll bring it down to negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And this will be at about 400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, so this should, technically, it should just slip on, maybe a little bit of assistance from a rubber mallet, but that's what we're hoping for, and that's what you need to do. Because if you don't, you're going to damage this shaft. This could be on crooked. Any little burr could, could move it. And then you're going to have bearing failure. You're going to have belt failure. And you pretty much just wasted a bunch of time and money. So with that out of the way, what we're going to do is... Now in another video, I'm going to assemble it. I wanted to get this one going before I started putting that together. Taking it apart was not that difficult besides pressing that off, but in reality, it's just like pressing anything else off with a tolerance fit. The bearings that we did find to be bad, this one here, I can feel it on my fingers. It's not a happy bearing. And with a load pushing down on it, manually pushing down on it, it does make a, a significant noise. And the other bearings we found that were a failure were these uh, primary kind of an idler shaft bearing. Uh, it just spins kind of freely and this goes into here with a pin, kind of a, a keyway style, and it aligns the shaft with this primary gear. Now this gear is what the spindle rides on because it goes up and down. And the spindle uh, gear on the spindle motor, excuse me, on the, on the motor itself, 
It's pretty tall. It's about two and a half inches tall, so it has plenty of throw. And as it sits in there, this being up, this gear sits on here. I believe this is low gear, and when it drops down, that is high gear. If it makes sense, because the bigger gear here, onto here. And it only made a terrible noise in high gear. We're assuming the load on that being on these bearings and this bearing. The gears check out fine. No issues, no wear. The shaft looks great. Same with this, the primary drive gear. This is a, a nylon locking nut, so you do have to inspect that. You do have to clean these really well. This is a very fine thread. You can easily cross thread it. Even before we assemble this, we're going to go through with a, a kind of a thread cleaner, a thread file, and just make sure we don't cross thread that because if that doesn't lock on, that's it. And what sits on this surface is this, the smaller bearing here. This one actually does sound pretty decent, but we're going to replace them all. Uh, that sits on there. And again, before we assemble this, we're actually going to sit the majority of these bearings on top of the toaster oven to kind of get some in, uh, convection heat going to them. And what that's going to do is that's going to assist to helping them slide on. They weren't too difficult. Once we kind of got them moving with the puller, they pretty much came right off. And this bearing here gets clamped in for the high-low shift assembly. We were having issues with our high-low shifting, especially in power bristol. We wound up having to kind of shut the air off while the machines trying to go to high low gear you know we hit reset we, we kind of pause the power restore and no matter what we do we would always do this in, in the morning and we'd have to wind up cutting air off letting it bleed down and then shocking whatever to get it to work to go into high gear and low gear to kind of cycle through so we realized the seals were pretty gone there was a lot of gunk build up inside there are very small orifices that allow the air to go into so we cleaned it up, new seals, new seal here, new uh, piston seal, and there's a uh, O-ring on the shaft here to seal the any air from going past the piston on the shaft. Now we have it assembled right now because we were checking the kind of the pressures to make sure there's plenty of vacuum in there, make sure we, we, we fix the issue. Hopefully that does, we'll find out. Uh, but again, we're gonna replace all the bearings, all the shafts look fine. We'll get those bearings replaced. They're relatively inexpensive. I believe these two bearings here are $9 a piece. This bearing is $18 a piece. And these bearings are about $11 or $12 a piece, give or take. Some of the seals, especially this seal here, looks fine. This seal actually seals. As the bearing's sitting on here, this seal slides on. And then, once that's protruding through, it's sitting, this bearing sits down in its receiving pocket there. This bolt's on here, and this seal's on the shaft, and that seal seals right there. Uh, and what I'm holding is the sump on the entire system. This is the pickup, and this is the drain back into the sump tank. Haas uh, puts a barb fitting on there that threads into here. And what we want to do is replacing it with a push lock, kind of a nylon air fitting. They use a a rubber hose, or not a rubber hose, but a, a very thin walled clear hose that collapses. On our older, other older VF3, the hose kind of disintegrated and we obviously couldn't pull this off because when this is bolted on here, there's no room to do it. This is obviously a swivel, so it's a little easier to install, but you would, you'd have to cut this so it would be a huge nightmare. I don't even think it would even go on. It probably might. But it's so tight in there, it's, it's next to impossible. There is a seal that I did order from McMaster. It's a double X profile seal, 5 8 uh, bore with a 13 16 OD. And I believe it's um, 103 thou thick. That goes into here. It's a wiper seal, oil seal for the high low shift shaft. And that goes up here. We will take this apart during assembly just to get it all back together, but I'm leaving it on there for now. So that covers the seals. McMaster does sell that. They have quite a few things that we needed for this. So most of the stuff is pretty generic. With that out of the way, uh, our isolators are okay. A little, a little beat up, a little dry. They're very, very grimy just because 
there are no gaskets on this. And what we recommend is the Permatex Aviation Forma Gasket. It's a liquid uh, gasket, part number 80019. This stuff's the best. And we'll go ahead and we'll apply this evenly and torque that down on all surfaces, especially on this surface here underneath. And then also up here where the motor sits, they had applied a little bit there. A lot of the stuff is gone, which caused it all to kind of just leak out grimy and it's just disgusting. On the upper plate here where the electric motor bolts onto, nothing too fancy about this. Pretty simple plate, receiving pocket, snap rings. We have that form of gasket that was originally on there, not that great, but we're going to apply new. On the older units, they have the copper lines that spray uh, hydraulic oil onto the bearings and the brass fittings, the newer ones, they kind of have uh, machined parts with stainless steel lines, I believe. Here are feed lines going in that come from the, our upper plate, very simple. Again, no gaskets going to that. Originally, we replaced our, originally we replaced our high-low air sh shift uh, solenoid assembly, and that still didn't fix the issue. And this is terrible from Haas, by the way. It's 1300 bucks, and you have to heavily modify the bracket. You have to orient these in a different uh, way to get them to fit on. So it was a very tedious process, especially being still on the machine to get it to work, to get it to fit. I suppose it does work, and obviously it would be a high-low high shift uh, assembly actuator that was the issue. Here's our shift uh, switches, our high-low switches. And right there is high and our low. Very grimy, very disgusting. It's a 1998, so it's, it's not gonna be pretty. When we first got the machine, our actual encoder drive system here, the drive belt, this gear was so far gone, the motor would actually surge and it was very noisy. It made the motor extremely noisy and surge. And you'd watch your, your spindle load indicator and it would just be bouncing around. And we realized it was just, this is from McMaster car. I forgot how many teeth are on here, but we wound up replacing that. I think it was only $20, not even. The belt, Haas sells the, the three millimeter belt. Um, it's an HTD300-3M. And it was $56, but if you go to polybelt.com, this exact belt, you buy five of them. The minimum order is five. And I think it was $17. I'm not joking, $17 for that. So much cheaper. And now we have a couple spares. The VF3 uses the same one. And this smoothed out the entire spindle motor process, you know, operation. Our encoder seems fine. We never had an issue with that. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to break this down into a couple videos. I apologize for kind of disassembling it uh, without filming it, but it, it's pretty basic with your, your mounting bolts that hold it down to this, to the base. Very simple here. When assembling it, we'll, you know, we'll go through that video, but the uh, assembling it, the main cog gear sits over this. And the main cog gear is actually almost flush with this surface. It doesn't have to be perfect because the main cog gear on the transmission is, it has walls, it's bladed to prevent the belt from walking and the spindle doesn't. So it kind of allows it to have a little bit of offset fit in, and eventually it'll find its center. We did have the spindle rebuilt on this VF2, I think two years ago. The spindle went out. They barely maintain this machine. They just kind of abused it away where they didn't take care of it, didn't check up on it. And the spindle went out. And so now we had it rebuilt by GTI Spindle in New Hampshire. It's balanced at 20,000 RPM. And the same gear, our same kind of press fit cog main drive gear, belt drive, uh, was pressed on. We, could, we couldn't do it. We couldn't get it off. And it was a lot easier for them. They, they can balance it. They can do all these things. They actually went up drilling it out, and in the next video I'll show you, they drilled it out, pulled it off, and bored it so that it now has a, 
tapered collar uh, fit so that they wind up using a snap ring to hold down. Have you ever seen a, a valve on an engine where it has these two keepers? That's essentially what they did. So they didn't utilize the press fit style. We don't have that capability. I don't feel like doing it. And we can press this, we can have this tolerance fit put back on, no issue. So we're gonna stick with that. And right now we'll cut this video off. If you have any comments or questions, drop them in there. Share this video, subscribe to the channel. I'll have more videos of doing this, kind of more of like a, a vlog style of, uh, of filming of what's going on in the shop and getting, you know, kind of pretty much doing so much to these machines. I, I like these machines quite a bit. I'll make a video about that. They're, they're simple, not too many differences in the overall construction of the machines versus something new. Obviously, the next generation control is way better. But I love the Haas control. Uh, I'm not going to say anything nice about Haas in, in the sense that I love their control. It is a great machine, but it's th there are definitely improvements. But they pump so many of these machines out. Uh, I think right now it's a 18 week, 18 weeks out of even getting your machine shipped because they're making so many VF2s, fours. It's insane, but I'll go through a couple of these uh, machines through some videos. And again, it, it's more of a vlog style. And uh, right now I got the camera on a, on a tripod here, so it's a little easier. But in the next video, I'll go through and hopefully have it up and running today. We have to go pick up the bearings and get this reassembled. We have plenty of the hydraulic oil. We'll do another cleaning and hope. Hopefully we fix it because there's there's no no telling, but it seems very simple, very generic when it comes to some of these bearings. I mean, I mean they, they have the trade numbers on them, so it's a deep groove bearing, steel, and they're readily available to get. So stay tuned. We'll have another video up for you guys uh, shortly. Thanks.